As I indicated previously, uh, the invasion of Ukraine has uh, revealed the vulnerability that our dependence on oil creates for our economy and for average Americans trying to fill up their cars and pay their heating bills. The fact is, the United States has sufficient domestic production to meet our energy needs today. We're producing more oil and refined product than ever before. Oil production was up more than a half a million barrels a day from January to December of last year, and it's expected to rise even more this year, which I would assume would mean that more and more Americans are working in the oil fields and elsewhere. In fact, uh, I believe last year the workforce grew to about 6.6 .6 million jobs, which we hadn't seen in the last year or two of the Trump administration. Unemployment now is hovering around 4%. Gross domestic product has been uh, significant, much more so than the preceding several years. But we do have uh, problems economically, and some of those problems are related to the international oil supply. Now, we certainly don't need Russian oil, and I have said we should stop importing it, and I'm glad that this morning the President announced the United States will officially ban the importation of oil from Russia denying Putin a key revenue source for his illegal war. This is something both Democrats and Republicans have called for, and the American people should know this policy choice will likely affect the price of gasoline. But even if we don't use Russian oil, everyone needs to know that petroleum is traded on the world market, and the U.S. is part of that world market. The chaos Putin is sowing in Europe will continue to have an effect here, regardless of where we get our oil. Our energy policy of over-reliance on fossil fuel is a matter of national security, and it's time we embrace all that entails. And the reality of a world market, combined with the impact on regular Americans who need to fill up their car, means the United States will have to make some tough choices on who we buy from if we're not buying from Russia. We will have to more carefully consider what we are exporting, how we will prevent profiteering, and what pain people should expect at the pump. If the climate crisis, raging fires, historic droughts, and flooding aren't enough to convince my colleagues on the other side of the aisle of the need to kick our oil addiction, I hope the national security and economic vulnerabilities exposed by Russia's invasion of Ukraine will be enough. As long as we base our energy future on oil, we choose to make ourselves vulnerable. Unfortunately, many of my Republican colleagues don't seem to recognize that reality. Instead, they focus on never built pipelines geared towards exporting oil, not using here in the United States. Most of that oil that was going through the pipeline that President Biden, I think because of many, many considerations, decided against, was destined for exportation, not used in the United States. Or they make claims about any production under Democratic presence that either contort or suspend reality. It's time to borrow the phrase of my Rhode Island colleagues in the White House. It's time to wake up. Indeed, the solution to high gas prices is more oil dependency. The bottom line is that we need to accelerate their transition to clean, renewable energy sources that aren't subject to worldwide scarcity and manipulation by our adversaries. There are however, things we should do in the short term to help consumers. And again, the, the advocates for the oil companies, the advocates for special tax arrangements, the, the advocates to continue to pump oil and pump oil and pump oil are playing right, in my sense, into the hands of a Putin. Because if our world economy is based on hydrocarbons, then Russia is going to make some money. If our world economy is based on other sources of power, alternative sources of power, then his cash register is going to ring close to zero. And I'm pleased that President Biden listened to me and others in Congress and decided to tap into the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to help bring down the price of oil. He wisely coordinated the release of 60 million barrels with our international partners. The action sends a reassuring signal to markets, but we may need to release more to tamp down prices. We also need to insist that our Middle East partners do more to increase production to help stabilize prices and meet demand in Europe. 
We should also ask domestic oil and gas producers to pitch in. Despite the other sides of the aisle's claims about the economy, big oil is earning some of its highest profits in years. They're not simply passing on the cost, the additional cost to the consumer reluctantly and grudgingly and sadly. ExxonMobil and Chevron, for example, reported combined net annual profits of nearly $38.6 billion in 2021. But are they investing those profits in new production, particularly when they have 14 million acres in unused leases? No. Instead, they are issuing higher dividends and buying back stock to boost share prices. These windfall profits should be used to help consumers, not their billionaire investors. Of course, the easiest way to insulate ourselves from higher costs is to become more energy efficient. When we consume less, we pay less. It's why I've long advocated better fuel economy standards for cars and trucks, something that the last administration worked against. Yes, the Trump administration tried to de derail an increase in gas mileage that the automobile companies were in favor of. Even when automakers said we should keep the toughest standards, Trump said no. Why? Let's be more dependent on gasoline. There's not only this country's oil producers will benefit, guess what? Putin will benefit, and others will benefit. Fortunately, the Biden administration has a broader vision for a clean energy future that eases the burden on consumers. While there's much more to do, the bipartisan infrastructure law took important steps on this front. It invests $7.5 billion to build out a national network of electric vehicle charges, $5 billion for electric buses, and $90 billion to improve public transit systems. It also includes $65 billion to upgrade our power infrastructure, including by building thousands of miles of new resilient transmission lines to facilitate the expansion of renewable energy. And we can't just look at transportation because consumers are also facing the pinch on home energy prices. Now, last year, I worked to secure $4.5 billion in the American Rescue Plan, for the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program to help consumers pay their energy bills. In the coming days, we will pass an omnibus appropriations bill to provide base funding for that program, which still lacks the resources to help all who qualified for assistance. But we need to do more. We also need to make other long-term investments. In his State of the Union address last week, President Biden emphasized the need to weatherize homes and businesses to be more energy efficient, which in turn lowers energy cost and reduces greenhouse gases emissions. And I cannot agree more. It's why I've led the fight to fund the Weatherization Assistance Program, which received $3.5 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law. This program has helped more than 7 million low-income families reduce their energy bills by making their homes more energy efficient. It saves participants nearly $300 in energy bills a year, and a Department of Energy study found that in one year it reduced carbon emissions. Members, please take their conversations off the floor. Senators recognized. Thank you. It reduced carbon emissions by more than 2.2 million metric tons, the equivalent to taking more than half a million cars off the road. To make the most of this investment, this week I introduced the Weatherization Assistance Program Improvement Act along with Senators Collins, Coons, and Shaheen. Our bill would make critical updates, including increasing eligibility, raising the per unit funding level for weatherization projects, and setting aside funding to make critical health and safety repairs in conjunction with weatherization projects. Together, these reforms will make the program more effective and will help to serve even more households across the country. These are significant steps, but we need the full package of climate energy reforms that the president has been calling for, including tax credits and grants that would make energy cleaner, vehicles cleaner, and other clean technology more affordable and competitive. If we do these things, we will make a huge difference in the lives of Americans today and for generations to come. And just a final thought, Mr. President, uh, I think one of the greatest nightmares that Vladimir Putin has is a world that is powered by electricity, not generated by 
hydrocarbons, a world in which the gasoline, the oil that he has in Russia is not worth $150 a barrel, but $1.50 a barrel. We can do it. And it'll be one of the most significant national security endeavors when we accomplish that. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.